Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. I am your host, Heather McFadden, and this is the place where I get to walk alongside you and connect you with people and resources so you know that you don't mom alone. And in this episode number 342, we're going to start every now and again offering an invitation to the new mom, some support, some encouragement in an area where she may be feeling isolated. And today I'm inviting Demetria Martin. She is a lactation consultant and owner of The Milk Buds, which you will hear more about in this episode, and Dr. Brittany Odom, who is a pediatrician, and we're going to cover the topic of breastfeeding. I think the the most important thing to kind of realize is sometimes you don't have a good sense of community around breastfeeding. Believe it or not, there's some, some pediatricians' offices that aren't super breastfeeding friendly. There's some family members that may not be supportive of your breastfeeding journey. There may be friends that are not as supportive. So um, you may feel pretty alone when you're kind of starting this out and you're new to it, baby's new to it. So kind of taking those things into consideration and giving yourself, you know, a pat on the back for how far you have come, even if it's been a day and a half, that's still a day and a half more than you've done before. So taking those small steps, knowing it is going to be a journey, you may be four, five, six, 12, 24 months in, and you may come across a new hurdle that you had never, you know, come across before. So taking it day by day and knowing that you do have some good support systems out there, it's just a matter of finding them and getting plugged in. These ladies are such kind guides in this journey, and I know that their hope and goal is to help you if breastfeeding is what you want to do. I wish I had their help back when I had my first, and even other children I had. Every child is so unique in this process, and so if you are on your third or fourth child and you are struggling in the area of breastfeeding, I want you to know that you're not alone in that, and In this conversation, we're going to talk about supply issues, nighttime feeding, what if you don't have the support in your family or local community, and I do want you to know, I I get that this is a continuum. There is no shame or blame if you are choosing not to breastfeed, and in fact, we hope to have an episode coming up with a lactation consultant who helps parents choose the right formula for their babies. So I want you to know, fed is best, they say that all the time, and I know that we carry a lot of guilt or shame related to this topic and freedom for everyone. I hope you feel that. Let's get right to it. Here we go. Hey, Demetria and Dr. Odom, welcome to the Don't Mom Alone podcast. Hello. Thanks for having us. This is going to be fun. I'm doing something a little unique. I want to support moms who are starting off their journey or maybe even moms who had two or three kids in their in this stage of infancy and needing some support and to know that they're not the only ones if some things are hard. And so today we're talking about breastfeeding. And I told some moms, friends of mine before I got here, that that's what I was going to talk about. These are moms that I sat on my couch and we cried about the whole challenges of breastfeeding. And they were like, oh man, (laughs) those days they can just bring you to your knees. It's so hard. So thank you for the work that you do. It's holy, holy work. (laughs) Would you introduce yourselves to the people listening so they know where you're coming from on this? Yep. So I'll jump in. So my name is Demetria Williams Martin. I am a certified lactation counselor and owner and founder of the Milk Buds. So this is a lactation service. Um, We provide lactation counseling as well as we have a breastfeeding subscription box for nursing and pumping moms. So cool. Yeah, I definitely want to connect everyone who's listening to the Milk Buds and um, just get more support there because obviously we're not going to cover all the ins and outs of everything. So, (laughs) But thank you, Demetria, for being here. We need a lactation consultant for sure when we talk about breastfeeding. (laughs) And then Dr. Odom, would you introduce yourself? Of course. Yeah. So I'm Dr. Brittany Odom. I'm a pediatrician in Illinois and Demetria and I actually went to Baylor University together. So that's where we met and we became sorority sisters and friends. And and now we get to work together on such a cool project. Um, So the Milk Bud, she started and I've kind of joined her in just creating some um, educational content um, from a pediatrician's perspective for breastfeeding moms to kind of help them throughout their journey. So, and that's kind of what I'm here to do today too. So just from a pediatrician's um, perspective and standpoint, kind of helping you guys out and 
and offering a little bit of tips and tricks and things that we kind of look for. So in general, it seems like hospitals are trying to encourage moms to choose breastfeeding. And sometimes moms can feel like they've already failed if they leave the hospital and it's not working and there's so much burden. And I am going to do an episode on picking the right formula. I think this is a whole spectrum. And I think you all would agree that fed is best, but for the mom who's struggling, talk to her. What are some usual questions or struggles she has that you've had to walk through with her? Yeah. So that's an excellent question. So I'll start off by saying the first few days and Demetra, you know, feel free to chime in if you agree or disagree, but I feel like those first few days are the hardest for a lot of moms when they're starting out. They don't know how to do it. It's, it's all new. It's new for the baby. It's new for mom. Um, and it's easy to feel defeated in those first few days, but the more practice they can get, the more um, time, you know, really having the baby latched on and having lactation work with you guys to, to make sure that we're doing it in the best possible way. I think the easier it gets slowly, 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 but those first few days are really tough. And really until um, that milk comes in, it can really feel as if, oh my gosh, I'm failing. You're not, you're not at all. Those first few days are just really hard. So sticking through it the best you can. So tell them about the milk coming in. It's like, well, what are we feeding them all those days if the milk hasn't come in? (laughs) That's a great question too. Yes. So for the first couple of days, it's a lot of colostrum, um, which is packed with nutrients. And it's it's perfect for those first few days um, of life for baby. You don't get a lot of volume, but it's it's jam packed with a lot of nutrients. So um, when we say milk come in, we mean more of the volume of the milk and it changes in its, um, you know, the consistency of the milk. And so it's just different. The colostrum versus the breastfeeding um, after those first few days, it's totally different. And what do you have the mom look for if she's feeling like it's not enough or they're not getting fed or they're screaming and crying, so I must be doing something wrong? What are some signs that it's okay as far as like amount the child's getting? Because we'll talk about other things, but. Yeah, yeah. So what we're looking at when we bring you guys in for that the first couple of visits really is um, the weight. So the weight of the baby is very, very important. So we're taking into consideration how much did your baby weigh when they were first born? From that point, really for the first, gosh, four to five days or so, we're usually dropping weight and that is totally normal. So a lot of moms will feel as if they're failing because that first visit at day three of life, their baby's lost, you know, 5% or 7% of their birth weight. And they're, you know, they have this look of defeat on their face. And I want to just give them a hug and say, no, this is totally normal. You're doing everything right. Um, So the baby will lose weight those first few days after that they start to gain that weight back. And so usually by week two, so by day 14 or so, we're usually back up to birth weight. So those are, those are the things we're kind of looking for. So during that um, kind of weight check visit around two weeks, if we're not back up to our birth weight, then I start to kind of, my little alert flag kind of goes off and I start to think about, you know, are we latching, right? Are we feeding at the right intervals? Are we still feeding overnight? Do we need to feed more often? And um, trying to kind of figure out where, where we can kind of optimize to. But more importantly, the, the weight gain and then also uh, making sure they're peeing quite a bit too. That is a good yeah. sign of hydration. I remember my little chart where I had to like, <laughs> yeah. mark when I fed, which side, how long on each side, all the things that came out of the baby and what they look like, the colors, the So blue. many things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Demetria, do you often visit moms in the hospital or do you do your work after? Yep. So I'd say that most of them I'm seeing is after. I have had a couple that call me for a virtual visit in the hospital. Um, a lot of hospitals have lactation support on site or on staff. And so they're able to get that. But there have been a few that, you know, I did their pregnancy breastfeeding class. And so they already had me. They already knew that they were going to call me. And so where do you get that class? Is that an online thing or is that yes, in person? It's, it's, It's all virtual right now due to the pandemic, but we will have it in person again soon. So did they sign up through the milk buds or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Most of us from the, the, uh, Jurassic period having babies (laughs) did not have that kind of support. There's definitely a lot more information. Moms aren't shocked that they still look pregnant when they leave and that sort of thing. And I remember a mom who she knew more, she was adopting and was taking medication so that she could breastfeed 
her son she adopted and have that kind of bond. So she was like oh. educating us on things about yeah. it. And yeah, it's, it's, we've come so far. So in that beginning stage, what advice would you have Demetria? Because I know latching is the challenge. I mean, yeah, it, and I've had four versions of a boy. I can't say it's my structure or their mouths. It's like, <laughs> you just, <laughs> Just yeah. don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> yeah. every baby is different. You may yeah. have had a perfect breastfeeding journey with the first one and they've been completely easy. And then the next child is a challenge. So every baby is different. It's their first time breastfeeding, even if it's your second kid and you've, or sixth kid and you've done it a billion times, it's still their day one. So one of the things that I recommend is people to really look at how does it feel? So if it feels painful, if it feels like it's hurting, if it's bleeding or not shaped right, something's not right. So that's when we really need to dive in and look at the latch, like Dr. Odom said, and really dig into, can we work on something? Is there something we can change here? Um, And so that's one of the most common things I get called for actually is this hurts. I'm six months in and it's still hurting. Something's not right. And by that point, I'm like, yes, something's not right. I wish you called me at week one <laughs> when it was okay. hurting. So if they're experiencing pain, I mean, I felt like at the very, very beginning, there was pain in that it causes your uterus to contract, which is really cool. Like yeah. that whole, how God made that up. <laughs> that's amazing. But that hurt. It hurt real bad. Yeah. I wanted to punch someone. It's so painful. <laughs> and it hurt worse with each kid. Like yeah. it, it, and someone said that by your third or fourth, it's worse. Yeah. So it definitely varies depending on the person. Some okay. people have no pain at all with that. So okay. don't get less, afraid. If you're bless listening. you people. Don't yeah. Out. Don't be freak out if there's pain, but <laughs> like, how do they know? Like there is some pain yeah, at the beginning yeah. and then what's like, this is not okay pain. Yeah. So there's definitely that initial, probably for the most part, never had anything latched onto my breast at this capacity, at this frequency before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, for the most part. Yeah. Um, and hopefully you haven't like worked on toughening up your nipples with sandpaper like they used to recommend. <gasps> if you're not doing that, oh yeah, that was once a recommendation. <laughs> so if you're oh not doing God. that, then you will expect some minor discomfort just from getting used to it. However, it shouldn't be a consistent throbbing, stabbing pain. It shouldn't be progressively getting worse and worse. And what really we need to look at is what does the nipple look like? So if the nipple looks one way before you nurse and then you take it out after you're finished nursing and it's completely squished or it looks like a lipstick, then those are signs that your latch is not effective. It's not, your baby's not latched right. So your baby has a soft spot, actually all do in our mouth that's really far back. And obviously with our baby's small mouth, our nipple goes in and hits that soft spot if we're actively nursing, right? But if we're not, then it's closer to the front and it's hitting that hard spot. And that's when the nipple shape starts changing. That's when that pain, the squishing, the bleeding really starts to happen. Um, I needed that information like 16 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) What? And I'm a speech pathologist. Like I know how the mouth is and the soft palate and all that jazz, but that is okay. Okay. That's real good. That's real practical right there. That's real practical. Okay. So, and then with like the cracking and the skin and there's all these products and there's shields and okay, what do we, do we need all that? Is that how do we know when we need extra stuff? Yeah. So there's definitely a case by case basis with that. I would say oftentimes if you are being given a shield, if you're at a hospital and a nurse or doctor, it's like, here's a shield, take it home, use it. You should call a lactation counselor then because most people shouldn't have to have a shield. And so that is one of the things a lot of people start using a shield initially because they're like, oh, I should, I should use this. But we've seen that using a nipple shield could lead to some poor milk transfer and it could cause more issues downstream. Most people that I see, most of my clients end up weaning from a shield and wish they would have weaned sooner because the process of getting used to breastfeeding without a shield and all of that, you're going to have to do it anyways. At some point, you'll more than likely make the decision to not have it. And so it's it's more effective to start trying to work on that early. Um, as far as the products go, 
there's definitely some products that may be helpful in the early days, but you really don't have to have anything. That's the beauty of breastfeeding is that you have everything you need right here. <laughs> you could literally just, here we go. I'm, I'm ready to go. And so, but there are some that definitely make things a little easier if you're struggling. And you guys probably have a list of helpful resources on your. Yep. Okay. All right. I have been so excited to share this week's sponsor with you. Not only are Fazzle's products beautiful, their socks, their hats, their mitts, they are warm, they are cozy and not itchy, and they're handmade in the Himalayas of India by happy ladies. These ladies are earning a fair wage because Fazzle is officially certified with the Fair Trade Federation. That means their artisans are well cared for. The supply chain is held accountable. They receive wages to help support their community and their families. This is the ultimate don't mom alone product for us, don't you think? So these wait ladies are making twice the amount they would make if they were working at the local market. And not only that, a portion of the net profits help support local orphanages in India. In fact, the founders, Mike and Vanessa, who are Canadian, moved to India in 2015, originally to work with these orphanages. And when they started Fazzle, they continued to work with the kids in the orphanages they support. If you're into vegan, these products are a blend of 80% acrylic, 20% nylon, making them 100% vegan. And they're long lasting. I love that the designs are indigenous to the local Himalayan people. So these designs are passed down from mother to daughter. How cool is that? So if you want to go check them out, go to shopfazzle.com. So Fazzle is spelled F-A-Z-L. Go to shopfazzle.com. Use a discount code DMA to get 15% off your purchase. That's shopfazzle, F-A-Z-L.com. And use the code DMA. These socks, hats, and mitts make great gifts for Christmas and such a good way for us to support other moms and kids in need in India. Dr. Odom, I know you have seen a lot of crying moms of newborns (laughs) in your office in those first visits. And what kind of support do you end up giving them? Like you were just saying, this feeling of failure. What other things do you see? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Demetra and I were kind of talking about this earlier too. And I think the the most important thing to kind of realize is sometimes you don't have a good sense of community around breastfeeding. Believe it or not, there's some pediatrician's offices that aren't super breastfeeding friendly there's some family members that may not be supportive of your breastfeeding journey. There may be friends that are not as supportive. So um, you may feel pretty alone when you're kind of starting this out and you're new to it, baby's new to it. So kind of taking those things into consideration and giving yourself, you know, a pat on the back for how far you have come, even if it's been a day and a half, that's still a day and a half more than you've done before. So taking those small steps, knowing it is going to be a journey you may be four, five, six, 12, 24 months in, and you may come across a new hurdle that you had never, you know, come across before. So taking it day by day and knowing that you do have some good support systems out there, it's just a matter of finding them and getting plugged in. And that's where Demetri and I come into play. So um, our lactation group here at our hospital is fantastic. And I send so many of my new moms over there just so they can get kind of plugged in with other moms that are also breastfeeding, get plugged in with good online resources, good community resources, other other friends and family members that maybe are breastfeeding that they can kind of lean on during those times where they're struggling. And then trying to, to in real time, identify where the problems are. So again, is it pain? Is it supply? Is it, you know, what is it that's causing the issue? And trying to address those things too on a more practical day-to-day, day-by-day standpoint too. But yes, it's very, very common for for a mom to come in and essentially break down right there when we're weighing her baby or when we're talking about fees and feel as if she's failing and 99% of the time we're not, we are not. It's just, we need to change a couple things here and there and we can do it. The issue I had, and maybe a mom listening has had with my oldest. So your first, you know, you're like, there's no manual. I have no experience. (laughs) Is he had severe reflux and 
it just looks like you nursed for this 45 minute session and they just threw everything up and you're like, it was all wasted. And then they're not gaining weight. And I remember we were on medication. I was micromanaging my husband because I was like, you can't jostle him after I feed him. I'll throw up the medicine. It just felt very stressful to keep the milk in. And then we were trying to diagnose, is it something I'm eating that makes it worse and trying to match up? Like, did I have onions for dinner last night? And if I eat dairy, does that make him? Anyway, it was so stressful and really impacted my relationship with my husband because of that. And so with the reflux and you being a pediatrician, how do you counsel moms when they're coming in? They're like, no, he just throws up so much. He's not getting enough. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing I look at again is the weight. So um, I would say a majority of, of parents that come in with those concerns of my baby spitting up after we eat, doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter if I keep him upright for 30 minutes, it doesn't matter. He still will spit it up. The first thing I look at is the weight. So if we're gaining good weight and we're still on a good trajectory on that growth curve, I'm not as concerned. So there's what we call a happy spitter. So a lot of babies, they will, they will spit up that little sphincter down there that's supposed to keep that milk down and keep our food down is just super floppy in babies. Everything's floppy in babies. So, and it's not (laughs) that far that that milk has to go for before it essentially pours right out of their body. So although it oftentimes will look as if they're pouring up everything we just gave them, a lot of the times they're not. Um, One of the kind of rules that I remember learning in in residency was if you take a a normal sheet of paper, a nine by 11 sheet of paper, if you cut that in half, that's about half of an ounce. So if a baby was to spit up on your shirt and it takes up about a half of a sheet of paper, so that's about half of an ounce that they spit up versus, you know, the two or three ounces you just gave them. So if they're still gaining, okay, then I'm okay with them spitting up here and there. However, with that being said, if we're, if we're spitting up and we, you know, we weigh you during the office visit and we're not quite gaining as much as we should, and we're really struggling and, you know, feedings aren't going well, we're not wanting to feed because it hurts. And just all those things that you had kind of mentioned, then we start to talk about some other solutions too. So do we need to, we'll make sure that we're staying upright after our feed. Sometimes we'll even thicken some of the feeds a little bit or start some medications or, or things like that. But it's, I emphasize when you were, when you were telling your story, because that's so many families where you, you have this liquid gold that you want to make sure stays in this little precious baby. You don't want to waste any of it. And it's, I, I, I feel it. I, I feel that pressure with so many families, but at the end of the day, that is best. And if we are gaining, then we are succeeding. So a lot of the spitting up that comes out, that's just extra bonus points that the baby didn't need. You can kind of think of it that way, but as long as they're feeding and gaining and we're on track of doing those things and and we're okay. We're okay. But I, oh gosh, it sure does add a lot of stress though. It really does. I totally get it. And then it's the whole, am I making enough? Do y'all get that? Yes, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You have no clue unless you pump and miss right. them feeding how much you're yeah. actually making. And I don't even know if the pump, well, the pumps when I had them were way worse than they are now. They're probably amazing. <laughs> They're probably controlled by your phone. I don't even know. There's an app for that. I'm guessing. They're probably. They do have some really cool pumps. Yes. They probably have some great pumps. Some. But so how do you counsel those gals who are like, I'm, I know I'm not making enough or my mom says, or my aunt says I'm not getting enough and I need to add, you know? Yeah. So I think I'll start. And I know Dr. Odom is going to have some stuff to add too, but I think we first target and look at the baby itself, look at the journey, look at how often they're actually nursing. But then we look at, you know, is this a misconception that they're not making enough? Is it that they have a mom that's at home that has never dealt with a breastfed baby that is feeding a bottle and is feeding them as if they were formula feeding, you know, trying to give them as much milk as they would have had then. And so, of course, the mom can't keep up if she's trying to give the baby eight ounces of breast milk at a session. So you're saying if you're feeding formula, you actually give more ounces than when they breastfeed. They don't need as many ounces. Is that what you're saying? Yep. So for breastfed babies, they need an ounce to an ounce and a half per hour since the last feeding. And that's for the most part, the duration of it. So there are some, and Dr. Odom can probably talk to it, but there are some cases where we may want to be feeding them more, but that 24 to 36 ounces, whether they're a 
six week old or a 12 month old, that's about where we're going to be. So it's not, it's not going to significantly change, but we often see that parents who are pumping and having someone else give them feed their baby, that they are being overfed with their bottles, or they're not being fed in a way where it's similar to breastfeeding, which is called paste feeding. Um, And so the baby's just taking in way too much. And over time, they're constantly taking in too much. And so mom starts to feel inadequate. And then we also have pictures of freezer stashes everywhere where someone shows you a freezer full of milk, and you think I should be adding five bags to my freezer each day. And that's just not realistic. We want to feed our baby, not necessarily the freezer. And so that's some of that we first look at is, is this an actual milk issue or is this just perceived? And so once we start seeing an actual milk issue, you know, someone is not nursing enough times during the day. Um, They're not actually getting enough milk. They've only pumped or breastfed four times. That's not enough. Like we need to be actively removing milk eight to 12 times target is really that 10 times a day to maintain our supply. And so we really wow. start looking oh at gosh. that. Oh my gosh. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. I forgot. Yes. <laughs> maybe it's like 10 eat, times a like day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I may be, I'm lucky long. if I get two meals a day. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 10 but times. We snack all okay. day long. Like even as adults, we're snacking often. And so if we think about the size of a baby's belly, they don't just have a lot that they can keep in their stomach and hold over for the next 12 hours. Like we may, they need to eat a little more consistently. And especially early on what we feed and how we nurse that's placing the order for breast milk for the next few days, for the next week, for the next month. So if I tell my body, I only need a nurse or pump four times today, tomorrow, my body's going to say, you only needed four times yesterday. I think you only need four times today. I'm going to start working towards that. And so we really look at that supply and say, if you want to increase your supply, we got to latch more. We have to pump more. We have to actively remove the milk. We have to move milk to make milk. So if they start sleeping through the night, then you're, you're having to increase your feedings during the day to make up for that. And we don't want to, because I like my freedom. (laughs) So that's the key too, is you have to decide, like you have to do your cost reward, risk reward scenarios. There's definitely a point where babies will sleep a little more often overnight and they may be more effective at removing milk during the day. And so they're removing more milk, not necessarily adding in a bunch of extra sessions during the day. But I don't know, Dr. Odom, if you say the same thing or think the same, but nighttime sleep issues and older babies are often resolved by daytime interventions. So if you're feeding more in the day, then you're more than likely going to be feeding enough for that baby to start sleeping some of those additional hours. Dr. Yeah. Odom, do you see that too? Yes, 100% agree with that. Yep, yep. Um, okay. Kind of along the same uh, kind of discussion, I guess, around nighttime feeds too. When it goes back to weight as well, one of the one of the things that I, I typically will pick up on if we're not quite gaining enough too over the first couple of weeks is that we're not feeding overnight. Um, so that's one thing I do want to throw in here too, is that it is important to still feed, just like Demetria was saying, still kind of keeping that same consistency overnight, just for the first couple of weeks. It's not forever, but just for the first couple of weeks, still staying on that routine of every couple hours, every two to three hours, still getting a good feed. Even if baby wants to sleep, we're still going to wake up to feed until we get back up to birth weight and we get a good routine going. But yeah, I totally agree though, Demetria. Totally agree. Okay. All right. So if she's feeling like her supply is low, we need to evaluate where that message is coming from. And if baby's still growing, and if you really feel like you're not, you know, there is an actual issue to evaluate how frequently and how long. And okay, those are all really good tips. Fed is best isn't just for newborns. It's true for families too. Everybody wants to eat. And I'll tell you what, knowing what's for dinner, especially in the fall with all of the activities and oh my goodness, we're heading into the holidays. It can be a real challenge. And that's why I want to tell y'all about HelloFresh as an option. If you've never tried a meal kit before, what's great about HelloFresh is you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients, seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. 
you don't have to make unnecessary trips to the grocery just for your dinner options. Believe me, I've done that. It gets expensive. <laughs> but with HelloFresh, what I love, because I've tried lots of meal kits, is their family-friendly options. So my boys have enjoyed everything that we've prepared through HelloFresh. I also love their recipe cards that when the boys come into the kitchen and they're like, what's for dinner? I can just hold up the card or I can call Bruce from wherever I'm driving about in DFW and say, hey, could you get started on dinner? The ingredients are all in a bag in the fridge and it has a card. It tells you what to do. I think this would be a great option if you want to help a new mom I mean, honestly, yes, we bring meals, but wouldn't it be great? It would help her feel like she is providing for her family, making dinner, getting it on the table, but you're taking away the trip to the grocery store where you're not sure, is the baby going to start crying right here in the checkout line? If you want to check it out, go to HelloFresh.com slash DMA14. Use the code DMA14 and you're going to get up to 14 free meals including free shipping. What? 14 free meals. That's amazing. So go to HelloFresh.com slash DMA14. Use the code DMA14. Get those meals, free shipping. I mean, really, y'all, what a great gift idea for a new mom or a mom who's having a new baby. And then she will find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. So if a mom is thinking, I'm over this, I don't like that I have to be doing this all the time. I don't want to have to pump. What encouragement do you give her that it's worth pushing through the hard? Because I don't, we're not going to shame the mom who she is not choosing to feed. This is not a match for her. But I also feel like there's this fine line of some things are hard, but we really find fulfillment in doing them. And so what do you say to that mom? For me specifically, when I have the mom come to me who's at that point, generally they're not coming to me unless they're wanting some support or wanting some, you know, affirmation that it's okay to make that decision. I am not the lactation counselor that says you have to breastfeed and this is the only way. <laughs> I'm like, figure it out. Like you're gonna do this regardless of how it your, your child won't turn out. They won't go to college unless <laughs> exactly. you do this. I, I'm not that person. I never have been. Yeah. Um, so I like to figure out what are they really asking for? So if they're saying like, I can't do this, it's hurting so bad. If we worked on it, the pain and if it wasn't hurting, like, would you like to continue? Well, yes, I, I actually want to breastfeed for six months. Okay, so let's, let me see if I can help you with that. But if they're like, I just want to wean, I need to know how to wean, help me wean. And, you know, after we start talking, that's really what they really want to do. Then I am let me help you with that. Let me help you come up with a weaning schedule. Let's work on it. But in the meantime, let me help you with your latch that I see as a problem. Just in case when you start actually working on it, you decide you want to continue, then you are still adequately latching and there's no issues, but you can choose to wean too. So kind of following their lead of what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And ultimately just as Demetri is saying, it is, it is a personal choice. And so there's a lot of reasons why moms may choose to no longer breastfeed. Um, it can be because, you know, they have five other kids at home and this is just not feasible or mom's trying to return to work and she can't bump at work or whatever it may be. There's a lot of, a lot of different reasons. And um, I think that's where my job as a pediatrician, where it really comes in, in I don't know, in, in handy or in play, but it's good for me to take into account the entire family. And so it's not just about this little precious newborn which a lot of times it may feel like it is, but it, it still is about the whole family and what works for mom, what works for what works for dad, what works for the entire family to get this baby healthy and fed. And sometimes breastfeeding may no longer be the best option. And ultimately, as we were saying earlier, if the baby is fed, I am happy. Um, and, and if your pediatrician feels otherwise, then that may be a discussion you should have with them. But really, it is important that the baby is being fed and that they're growing and developing. And you can do that with formula. You can do that with breast milk. We, we love when parents are, you know, wanting to breastfeed and there are so many benefits that do come with that. So I don't want to downplay those. However, ultimately it still is whatever decision is best for the family. So I fully support either way, either way, mom decides that she wants to, to feed the baby is fine. How often do you encounter moms who are struggling with some postpartum? And I've heard that can sometimes get worse the more kids you have not because you have more kids, but like hormonally. (laughs) Um, But 
she's already struggling like hormonally and emotionally with some postpartum depression. How do you counsel her? It, is the breastfeeding going to help with that hormonal regulation? Or if she's struggling, is it making her feel more depressed? Like, is that a case to case situation? Yeah. So generally it is a case to case. However, there have been some studies that have shown that breastfeeding can help with postpartum too. It can lower mom's stress levels. It can help with postpartum. Um, there is that bonding that you get with breastfeeding um, that a lot of moms will, will talk about too, that can help with their mood. And it kind of goes back to figuring out kind of why are we feeling this way? And a lot of times moms don't know when you're, when you're feeling depressed, you're feeling depressed. I mean, they can win a million dollars and still feel depressed. It's not really any sort of situation, but sometimes there are some situations where there's something going on. There's situations that are making their, their mood you know, more depressed. And so sometimes addressing those specific, those specific things can be helpful. For instance, if they don't, you know, they don't have enough, you know, food to feed their other child at home or, or they can't pay their bills or, you know, or something's a family stressor, their mom is sick or their husband just lost his job, or there can be other things that are kind of playing into um, a mom's mood. And then having a new baby on top of that is a, is a, a giant stressor, a very cute and adorable stressor, but it's a stressor. Yeah. Um, so Especially it's still if they're important. crying a lot, if they happen to have oh a personality gosh. that's exactly. not appeasable. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, you're, it's exactly. like another like F plus in your life. Yeah. That's already <laughs> feeling like an F plus you're like, I can't even keep this kid from crying all the time. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. 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 So it's important to, um, to realize those things and talk about those things too. Um, it's one thing to kind of slap a diagnosis of saying, okay, postpartum depression and kind of calling it a day, but it's another to kind of dig into what's going on and how can we help these, these moms that are, that are really struggling. And for some moms that breastfeeding can be not necessarily the answer to all of the, of the issues, but it can help a little bit. So I, I, I do recommend still going ahead and trying to breastfeed, even if you're kind of feeling those feelings and kind of talking it through too. Are there free resources for lack? consulting or is it always a paid service? That's a great question. So there's definitely a lot of places that offer free resources. There's um, even groups of peer support groups that would help. Um, and oftentimes lactation counselors or consultants are actively part of them. Hospitals have a lot of free resources. WIC has free resources with lactation um, counseling so there, there definitely are a lot of options. There, of course, are some paid ones as well. Because I can imagine, like you were describing, if life is falling apart and things are hard and finances are stressed, if I can get the support to feel like I'm doing something well. Yeah. And many insurances actually cover it. Oh, so a that's lot of great. insurances will cover. So I know personally, like I looked at mine the other day just to see what it said. And um, it covers six sessions. And so okay. like, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot that's of really great. That's really good. That's really great. That's really good to know. Okay. Is there anything we're going to connect them with y'all when they sign up for a subscription, what are they getting? That's a great question. So we have a subscription box that they receive that has products and nice things to help support breastfeeding. So it could have educational resources, um, could be some of those products we talked about earlier, could be breast massagers, just different things. And then we also have a digital library that we put together. So this digital library is something that at 2 a.m. they can wake up, they're having issues, they can't reach out to anyone. They can go to this library and we have a spot where it says, I'm having trouble with clogged ducts. And they oh can gosh, pull up some of those awesome. resources and get help immediately. Um, and then Dr. Odom touched on it earlier, but she's also partnered with us and really given us a, do you want to talk? <laughs> about it, Dr. Rona, it's probably better for you too. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I, um, essentially we, we created these videos for a mom and, and they're really based on the age of the baby. So, um, you know, during month one, what are some of the issues that we're dealing with? What are some of the important things that we know starting out for breastfeeding versus, you know, when they're a toddler and we're still breastfeeding, what are some things we can be trying then? And what are some different, you know, methods we can use to to help them stay focused while breastfeeding. And so it really is, is age dependent, each one of these videos that they can um, log on and watch and kind of hopefully get a little bit of support and tips and tricks for, uh, for breastfeeding for that age group. <laughs> this feels like the ultimate don't mom alone option yes. <laughs> that yes. you were like available in the moment with the challenge. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Cause don't a lot of moms like, um, what is it? A mastitis? What am I saying? Mastitis? Is that a thing? Mastitis. Yeah. yeah mastitis. mastitis. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. man, it's been a while. Um, but that was a thing <laughs> where like all of a sudden things are swollen. You have a fever. Mom is going yeah. down and you don't, you're yeah. like, what is happening? She could have searched on your, through the subscription and. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's pretty awesome. And also we have a support group. So we have a Facebook group that we Amazing. have of these moms that are part of it. And so they can ask questions or ask for support. Has anyone had this happen before? This is weird. Is this normal? Or are my babies getting teeth that six months? Like, what do I do? What, what changes should I make? And so it's, it's really cool to see them interact and build that community. And then as part of that as well, we also have a monthly session. So it's a Q and a, um, so that's with me or other professionals where they can ask questions, get support. It's almost like having a session, like a lactation session included in the box or subscription, but with a group type setting. So it's pretty cool. Um, amazing. Seriously. (laughs) Gosh, (laughs) I need to have more babies. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> when I have my grandbabies, which I'm closer to than my actual <laughs> you all are the best. We will put links to all these things. I have loved getting to know you and thank you for connecting with these moms today and for what you do. It really matters. It's very important. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, we enjoyed this. Honor. An honor. Definitely check out themilkbuds.com if you are looking for support or if you want to send a new mama subscription box, there's a a little tab there that you can click and find out more about that. Um, We've put all those links in the show notes. I'm going to pray over us. Um, I know this can be a weary time and discouraging. So Lord, I lift this mom up to you. I thank you for her deep desire to care for her baby, to love the one that you've given her. I also pray against um, depression. I pray against discouragement. I know this is a really big assignment to mother well, and I pray that she would lean on you, that she is not fully responsible for this child, that you are right there with her. That in those moments, those middle of the night feedings, those places where she feels completely alone, that she could call on you and that your Holy Spirit's presence will comfort her. I pray, Lord, that you would provide the friends and the community to come alongside her in whatever part of her feeding journey she's on, that she would be supported, that she would be brave and reach out. Thank you, Lord, for Dr. Odom. I thank you for Dimitri. I thank you for the work that they're doing, that you would continue to encourage them in this ministry. And Lord, I just praise you that you are our provider, that you give us what we need when we need it. I pray for all these relationships represented, moms and babies, that nothing would get in the way of their connection with one another and a place of belonging that this child desires. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, y'all, for joining me today. I'll meet you back here next week. And thank you for all your support with the book. Oh, my goodness. What a great, I called it a whirlwind of love. It was just so kind. The on release day, I got to do a book signing. I got to um, be with friends at lunch and then out to dinner with my family. And then after we left dinner, I found out that the book was number one in new releases of mom books. And that was just so special. Uh, It was really an encouragement to my heart because I finished the book not thinking about all the moms that it would encourage. And uh, y'all, this is an only God story and you are part of that. So thank you for sharing with friends. If you want to know more about the book, go to don'tmomalone.com forward slash book. You can find all the places where you can get a copy If you ordered a hard copy from Amazon, I will let you know that uh, I don't think they were supposed to have that option up there. And so you may want to, if you got an email that said it's not going to come for a month, you might just want to cancel that order and get a paperback because you'll get the paperback tomorrow. So um, just thought I'd throw that in there. All right. Y'all have a great rest of your week. Adios. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Don't Mom Alone podcast. If you're wanting to connect with more people and more resources to help remind you that you're not alone, head over to don'tmomalone.com. That's where you'll also find show notes with any links mentioned by our guests. Most importantly, I want you to know the good news, the great news that you're not alone because God has promised to always be with you. With faith in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, Jesus said when he left, he was going to leave a helper, a comforter to be with us. God in us. Moms, that's super power. So while you're washing dishes at your kitchen sink, while you're driving to and from work, while you're feeding that baby late into the night, while you're cleaning sticky floors, God promises to be just as present with you as when you're worshiping in a church pew. As it says in Zephaniah 317, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He takes great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now that's good news. Have a great day.